And now for our next contestant. Your name, please? Hecuba. And your occupation? Queen of Troy. And your desired fortune? A lifetime of happiness. Fortuna spins the wheel! <gasps> oh, I'm afraid to say, news isn't good. Your fate is a lifetime of slavery, your husband's murder, and your city destroyed. <gasps> well, better luck next time. Fate is a fickle thing. And now for our final contestant. My, my. Your name, my dear? Helen. And occupation? Queen of Sparta. Und desired fortune? To leave my husband for Paris, Prince of Troy. Well, Fortuna, you know what to do. Spin that wheel! Jackpot, baby! German composer Karl Orff was always fascinated by the whims of fortune. As a young boy, he loved building miniature puppet theatres and playing the part of fate. Nothing was more exciting than inventing his characters' stories, writing their music and pulling their strings. And in 1934, Orff chanced upon an anthology of medieval poems that further excited this lifelong passion. The poems painted a picture of the way past civilizations thought about the vagaries of fate. The tome was called Carmino Burana, Latin for Songs from Bavaria, for they were originally discovered in the library of an ancient Bavarian monastery. The poems were written in the 11th and 12th centuries by Goliards. Goliard comes from the old French for big mouths, and boy did they have big mouths. They were a roving bunch of lapsed monks, bohemian theologians, street poets and university dropouts. And they wrote satirical poems to poke fun at the Catholic Church, to spread their own gospel of gambling, binge drinking, womanizing and pleasure seeking, not very godly at all. But they did celebrate the virtues of two pagan goddesses, Venus, the Roman goddess of love, beauty and sex, and Fortuna, Lady Luck, in whose hands our fate is determined. Orff selected 24 poems from the anthology, the ones he thought best reflected the earthy concerns of the Goliards. He illustrated these scenes of medieval life with the theatrical cantata, essentially a multi-movement narrative work for voices and orchestra. Carmina Burana was the final product and was staged with elaborate scenery, immersive lighting, fabulous costumes and gymnastic dance. Quite a step up from his bedroom puppet theatres, but perfect for expressing the directness and sensuality of the Goliard poems. Carmina Burana starts with a dramatic hymn to Fortuna. Empress of the world, she spins her wheel of fortune. If you're at the bottom of the wheel, fate is against you. But even when you're in the midst of good fortune, seated at the top, everything can be lost with another spin of the wheel. Worst of all, Fortuna is so sadistic that she spins at random. The choir sings a short killer motif in unison much like a Gregorian chant. They say how Fortuna is as uncontrollable as the waxing and waning of the moon. Timpani, drum and ostinato are repeating rhythm under the choir, and repetition is everything here, for the wheel spin is relentless. The choir then sings of Hecuba. She's a textbook case of Fortune's cruelty, for Hecuba was once Queen of Troy, but when her son, Paris, eloped with Queen Helen of Sparta, it caused a war that saw Hecuba enslaved, her husband slain, and her city destroyed. The message is this. Rather than wait for fortune to strike, we've got to grab opportunities when we see them. 
But the issue with grabbing opportunities is that Ocasio, god of opportunity and actually Fortuna's lover, has a reverse mullet. Huh? Yeah, apparently Ocasio's only got a single lock of hair on his forehead, but he's totally bald on the back of his head, so you've basically got to grab onto his hair when he's coming towards you. Right. Next, wind instruments usher in spring. They personify Zephyr, Greek god of the west wind. The choir sing their praise to Flora, the Roman flower goddess, and Phoebus, the Greek sun god. Spring is the season for lovers romancing on the green meadows after winter's indoor seclusion. The droning accompaniment of the orchestra is utterly simple, just two notes tolling like a church bell. But a baritone tells us that even in spring, the cold heartlessness of Fortuna is never far behind. Not everyone is so lucky to find romance. For those who have, who are at the top of Fortuna's wheel, it merely takes another spin to reveal your lovers been unfaithful. Perhaps Venus can help. For we're told that if we obey her call, better news awaits. Just think of Paris, Prince of Troy. His reward for judging Venus, the fairest goddess of all, was the love of the world's most beautiful woman, Helen of Sparta. Basically, if we submit to Venus, all will be well. Or will it? Take the sorry story of these women. They're praising the abundance and joy of the Bavarian meadows. Yet when they flirtatiously ask, where is my lover? The men reply, he's ridden off into the distance. Timpani mimic the horse's hoofbeats. A diminuendo in the choir imitates the lover riding away. Who will love me now? The women ask longingly. They sigh a yearning, ah. Having sung their sorry story in Latin, the women now make the same point by singing in another language, Middle High German. You see, Orf was a sucker not just for early music, but for medieval languages. He loved how direct and graphic they could be, and he deploys them here to hammer home that very direct message, that it's awful to have no lover, especially when the springtime forest is so fertile. But now it's time to go makeup shopping. That's right. The women start pestering a shopkeeper for rouge to redden their cheeks. Once they've applied it, they cry out, Look at me, young men, let me please you, and if you don't take notice, we'll force you to love us against your will. This is no courtly, noble love. This is Goliard-approved lust. The carnal games continue in a boisterous dance. The maidens bring on the tees to the sound of furiously plucking strings. They attempt some reverse psychology on fate. They say, us girls who dance round here wish to spend all this summer long without men. Maybe if they say it, Fortuna might just drop a hot guy on the single ladies. A brass fanfare announces the men's macho fantasy. If all the world were mine, they say, I'd give it up just to sleep with the Queen of England. A reference to Eleanor of Aquitaine, the 12th century's most beautiful woman and probably its most scandalous. She divorced prim and proper Louis VII of France to run off with a much younger man who'd become Henry II of England. But fantasy's just fantasy. Now it's time for some hard-up reality. The scene switches to the tavern, where a low-life vagrant sings the credo of the Goliards. He says he's forsaken morality. He's dedicating his life to drinking, gambling, women and gluttony. Oh, and talking of gluttony, an expensive feast is now served for the tavern's patrons, a swan. A bassoon mimics its croak before the axe comes down. As the swan turns round and round on the spit, a tenor voice sings from the poor bird's point of view. The part is sung falsetto, meaning beyond the singer's normal vocal range. 
It conveys an image of the roasting swan screaming out as it recalls its former grace and beauty. Cruel fate put it on a plate. Chattering teeth gnash away at its flesh. Pretty grotesque stuff, straight from the pen of a medieval animal rights activist. Enough to turn you vegan forever. Now we've all got that friend who drinks too much at a party and seriously embarrasses themselves. Well, some drunk guy is now doing this at the feast. He's making a totally cringe speech about how he's the abbot of cocaine, an imaginary land of boundless pleasure. He delivers a mock sermon about the virtues of gambling. He says he's the follower of the patron saint of dice. And instead of freeing his drunk congregation of their sins, this minister's going to free them of their clothes after they gamble them away. But gambler's luck is temporary, and when the wheel of fortune turns, he can only cry out in frustration, Wafner, a medieval swear word. The frenzied boozers then sing a tongue-twisting toast to wine merchants, prisoners, the living, all Christians, the faithful dead, lusty nuns, forest highwaymen, errant brothers, scattered monks, sailors, quarrelling men, those doing penance and travellers. Oh, and the Pope. Oh, and the King. Oh, and also mistresses and masters, priests and deacons, brothers and sisters, servants and maids, men and women. Basically, the most inclusive drinking song ever. And for those who don't drink, be cast into eternal damnation. It's now time to leave the tavern for the perfumed court of love, where that baritone from earlier is still bemoaning his lovelorn state. He's like an angry teenager, complaining that the world is stacked up against him, paranoid that chatty girls are laughing at him. Certainly his friends are poking fun at him. He sings falsetto like a foppish troubadour. He pines for a maiden whose kiss might warm his heart. He sings in Old French, the ultimate love language. A soprano responds with a teasing image of a woman bedecked in a radiant red dress. The sparse accompaniment of a heartbeat underpins her erotic words. But when the baritone responds, he totally slips up. He stupidly reveals that all he's ever wanted to do is unlock the chains of her virginity. The women catch on to the ruse. They cry out, you better keep singing, you can't have us, it's not working. Next, a sextet of leering men sings a cappella. They've been worked up into a frenzy. They talk about all the naughty things that happen when boys and girls linger too long in a cellar together. All restraint is now banished. The women confront the men, breathlessly declaring their passion. If you thought this was innocent love between a troubadour and a virginal maiden, think again. This is highly sexed men and women. They bleat nonsense words at each other in crazed ecstasy. Orf uses the rhythmic drive of the music to provide a sense of wild abandonment. It's why Stravinsky called him a neo-Neanderthal. But the rising passion is soon interrupted by a serene aria. The soprano announces her dilemma, to choose between the chaste life of a virgin or wanton love. Stay tuned for the answer in a second. For now, the baritone stammers in boiling anticipation of amorous bliss. Oh, 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 I bloom all over, now for the love of a girl. I burn all over, it is a new love. To which the women scream, a love for which I die. They declare that their virginity makes them frisky, and very appropriately, Cupid pops along in the guise of a young boy's choir. And not before long, the soprano returns for her answer. She soars rapturously to the highest reaches of her voice. Sweetest boy, I give myself to you totally. Love blossoms between the united couple and the entire chorus sings a glorious hymn. They praise Blanche Fleur, a popular heroine from medieval romances. They also praise Helen of Sparta, who left her husband for the love of Paris. The hymn is a parody of the Ave Maria, yet it's deeply anti-Christian. Rather than honouring the Virgin Mary, it's a celebration of the pagan goddess of carnal love. 
For though a Christian may look on Helen's affair with disappointment, the Goliards would have it that she and Blanche Fleur were simply submitting to Venus. Yet as soon as we reach the pinnacle of love, we're rudely interrupted by... You've guessed it, Fortuna. The piece ends with a repeat of the very opening to let us know that the wheel has turned full circle. Love is only ever fleeting, and when you're at the top, the only way is down. Come all and weep with me are the depressing final words. Orff watched on anxiously at the 1937 premiere of Carmina Bravana in Frankfurt. Nazi party officials were scrutinising the production from the front row. They were uncomfortable with its erotic tone and unfamiliar, foreign-sounding rhythms. But it was an enormous popular success that turned Karl Orff into an overnight sensation at the age of 42. He immediately ordered his publishers to destroy everything he'd previously written. Carmina Burana explores the full breadth and depth of human emotions and experiences. Emotions and experiences as relevant in today's society as to the 12th century Goliaths. The fickleness of fortune, the ephemeral nature of life's joys, the triumph of spring, the pleasures and perils of drinking, gambling, gluttony and lust. As the wheel spins, Joy turns to bitterness, love to loss, hope to grief. And to think that these days most will recognise Carmina Bavana in aftershave adverts, football adverts, burger bar adverts and the X Factor. How unpredictable and random fortune can be. Well that's it folks. Follow our channel, support us on Patreon, listen to the piece in full and most importantly, enjoy classical music.